The most mysterious beings in the Bible. Number one, 24 elders. Who are the 24 elders? Beyond our understanding and perception lies a magnificent throne room in heaven, radiant with divine light and power. This place is really special. It's where the most powerful being in the universe lives. When John was sent to the island of Patmos, he experienced visions that are among the most captivating stories in the Bible. In these visions, including the one about the 24 elders, we glimpse the marvels of a heavenly realm. Within this extraordinary setting, we notice a group of 24 elders. They wear white robes, their heads are crowned with gold, and they sit in a circle around the central throne. Who are these individuals and what is their purpose? This scene isn't just a piece of history or a distant reality. It holds deep significance and prompts us to reflect on its meaning and the lessons it conveys. But who are these 24? What role do they play in judgment and redemption? And what can their presence teach us about our place in the grand narrative of existence? Apostle John was a prominent figure in the New Testament. He wrote the Gospel of John, three epistles, 1st, 2nd, and 3rd John, and the visionary book of Revelation. He was a close companion of Jesus, part of his inner circle alongside Peter and James. This John was not the same as John the Baptist. Exiled on the island of Patmos by Roman authorities, John faced isolation and hardship due to his unwavering faith and his tireless work of spreading the message of Jesus Christ. He faced persecution. The aim was to silence him, and his powerful teachings banished him to the island, a small, rocky, and desolate place in the Aegean Sea. This was common during those times, exiling troublesome individuals to isolated islands. Yet, in this challenging time, he received profound visions from God, leading to the writing of Revelation. He described himself as a fellow sufferer for Christ, emphasizing perseverance in faith. Suddenly, John found himself in the very throne room of God. He saw God seated on a throne there, looking like precious gemstones. Surrounding his throne were 24 other thrones, and on these thrones sat 24 elders. These elders wore white robes with golden crowns on their heads. John has an encounter with 24 elders. If we could ask an angel who could interpret for us, what are the elders? It would be really useful. There are at least 13 views of their identity, spanning from the 24 ruling stars or judges in the heavens to a straightforward representation of completeness and comprehensiveness. The elders are always associated with the four living creatures. There are 12 months in a lunar year, 12 tribes of Israel, 12 apostles, 12 gates in the New Jerusalem, 12 angels at each gate, 12 foundations, 12,000 sealed from each tribe, and so on. In the Bible, 12 appears to represent the number of divine governments. There is undoubtedly a connection between the significance of the number 12 and that of its multiples such as 24 or any other multiple. Thrones are related to the heavenly powers. The entire scene was one of unimaginable splendor, worship, and adoration. The elders, along with the four living creatures around the throne, fell before God, casting their crowns before Him and declaring, you are worthy, O Lord, to receive glory and honor and power, for you created all things, and by your will they existed and were created. Revelation 4.11 There is no place in the book of Revelation where the 24 elders' identities are laid out in detail. On the other hand, it is highly likely that they are representatives of the church. Some people believe that they are angelic beings. However, this is highly unlikely to be the case. It is clear that they reign alongside Christ because of the fact that they are seated on thrones. It is proclaimed again and over again that the church rules and reigns with Christ. Revelation 5.10 You have made them into a kingdom and priests to our God, and they will reign upon the earth. In addition, the Greek word that has been translated here as elders is never used to refer to angels. Rather, it is only ever used to refer to men and more specifically men of a certain age who have reached maturity and are capable of ruling the church. Angels do not experience the effects of aging, hence we cannot use the term elder to describe them. Although angels can be seen wearing white, the color white is more frequently associated with believers because it represents the righteousness of Christ that is ascribed to us at salvation. Revelation 3.5 
The one who overcomes will be clothed the same way, in white garments. And I will not erase his name from the book of life, and I will confess his name before my Father and before his angels. Revelation 3.18 I advise you to buy from me gold refined by fire, so that you may become rich, and white garments, so that you may clothe yourselves, and the shame of your nakedness will not be revealed, and eye salve to apply to your eyes, so that you may see. The elders are wearing golden crowns, which is another indication that they're not angels. Angels are never given crowns, and no evidence has ever been found of angels actually wearing them. The term that is translated here as crown alludes to the victor's crown, which is worn by those who have contended effectively and won the victory as Christ promised. Revelation 2.10 Do not fear what you are about to suffer. Behold, the devil is about to throw some of you into prison, so that you will be tested, and you will have tribulation for ten days. Be faithful until death, and I will give you the crown of life. The bowls that the 24 elders in Revelation 5 are seen to be holding provide another justification for viewing them as representations of the church. Revelation 5, 8-10 When he had taken the scroll, the four living creatures and the 24 elders fell down before the Lamb, each one holding a harp and golden bowls full of incense, which are the prayers of the saints. And they sang a new song, saying, Worthy are you to take the scroll and to break its seals. For you were slaughtered, and you purchased people for God with your blood from every tribe, language, people, and nation. You have made them into a kingdom and priests to our God, and they will reign upon the earth. The elders symbolically represent the prayers of the saints. On the other hand, they did not act as mediators for the people of God. Elders are seen as representatives of God's people, particularly in the Old Testament. They are adorned with crowns of victory and have moved on to the location that the Redeemer has prepared for them. Role and Responsibilities The 24 elders as described in the book of Revelation have distinct roles and responsibilities, primarily centered around worship and service to God. Here's a breakdown of their duties. First, they worship. One of the primary roles of the 24 elders is to worship God continually. They are often depicted falling down before the throne of God in reverence and adoration. The twenty-four elders fall down before Him who sits on the throne and worship Him who lives forever and ever. They lay their crowns before the throne and say, You are worthy, our Lord and God, to receive glory and honor and power. For You created all things, and by Your will they were created and have their being. Revelation 4, 10-11 God is honored by the 24 elders, which verbally translates to credit worth or worthiness to God. As they laid their crowns in front of the throne, the elders gave God the glory for their own work as well as the reward they had earned. They were able to see that the worth and the worthiness did not lie with themselves, but rather with God. We read, Casting the crowns simply acted out their declaration, You are worthy, O Lord, to receive glory and honor and power. If God was worthy of glory and honor and power, then He should get the crown. There is also a reference to a custom that existed during the Roman Empire. The Emperor of Rome exercised authority over many lesser kings, and these kings were frequently required to pay tribute to the Emperor by presenting themselves before him and placing their crowns on the ground before him. After that, he would hand them back to them as evidence that he was the one who had given them their crowns their right to rule, and their victory. The crowns mentioned in Revelation 4.10 are the Stephanos crowns of victory, not royalty. These are the crowns of achievement that a victorious athlete in the ancient Olympian games would receive for their accomplishments. Number 2. Leviathan, the Sea Monster In the Bible, there are stories and teachings that include some very mysterious characters that are hard to understand or categorize. These characters are not as well known, but they still paint an important role. In Psalm 74, 12-14, we read about a powerful moment where God shows His might and leadership by overcoming Leviathan. This victory is more than just a battle won. It represents God's supreme power to control what seems uncontrollable and to defeat evil. God's triumph over Leviathan isn't just a win. It's a message that He can bring peace and order where there once was chaos and destruction. Now, let's talk about Leviathan itself. 
This immense sea creature is recognized in many ancient writings, including the Bible, and it has fascinated people for generations. Leviathan isn't just any creature. It stands as a symbol of chaos, massive forces, or nature's wild strength that humans can't tame. When we focus on how Leviathan is portrayed in the Hebrew Bible and what it means in Christian thought, we see it's not just about a sea monster. It's about understanding God's power and the deep message woven into these stories. Leviathan teaches us about the struggles between good and evil and the belief that ultimately, God can tame what seems untamable and bring harmony to a world of chaos. Biblical Portrayal of the Leviathan In the Hebrew Bible, especially in the books of Job and Psalms, we are introduced to the Leviathan, a huge and powerful sea beast. Job 41 gives us a close-up of this mighty creature. It talks about its gigantic size, scales that no weapon can get through, breath that seems to set the air on fire, and incredible power that leaves people in awe. This description is meant to show us that the Leviathan is a creature that humans can't tame or control. In Isaiah 27.1, Leviathan is depicted as a symbol of God's judgment upon the nations. The imagery of God slaying Leviathan represents his righteous judgment and ultimate victory over the forces of evil and oppression. Some interpretations view Leviathan as a metaphor for oppressive rulers or empires that oppose God's kingdom. The passage emphasizes God's role as the ultimate judge and leader of the nations, foreshadowing his triumph over all earthly powers. In Psalm 89, 9-10, Leviathan is referenced in this psalm as one of the creatures over which God exercises dominion. Some interpretations view Leviathan here as a literal creature, emphasizing God's sovereignty over the natural world. Others see Leviathan as a metaphorical symbol for the cosmic forces of chaos and evil that God subdues and controls. The passage highlights God's power and authority as the supreme leader of the universe. Interpretations of Leviathan across various biblical passages range from literal to metaphorical, reflecting different theological perspectives and themes within the biblical narrative. While some passages emphasize Leviathan as a fearsome sea creature, Others use it as a symbol to convey deeper spiritual truths about God's sovereignty, judgment, and victory over evil. As believers engage with these passages, they may gain a deeper understanding of the significance of Leviathan within the biblical narrative and its implications for their faith and spiritual journey. Number 3. Cherubim – Guardians of God's Presence 1 Kings 6, 23-28 Inside the inner sanctuary he made two cherubim of olive wood, each ten cubits high. One wing of the first cherub was five cubits long, and the other wing five cubits, ten cubits from wingtip to wingtip. The second cherub also measured ten cubits, for the two cherubim were identical in size and shape. The height of each cherub was ten cubits. He placed the cherubim inside the innermost room of the temple with their wings spread out. The wing of one cherub touched one wall, while the wing of the other touched the other wall, and their wings touched each other in the middle of the room. He overlaid the cherubim with gold. The cherubim as guardians of God's presence. Described as celestial beings with profound symbolism and sacred duties, the cherubim are intimately associated with the divine presence and the sanctity of God's dwelling place. As guardians of God's presence, the cherubim serve several key functions within the biblical narrative, reflecting deeper theological truths about the nature of God and His relationship with humanity. Below are some aspects of the cherubim's role as guardians of God's presence. The cherubim are often depicted as guarding sacred spaces such as the Garden of Eden, the Ark of the Covenant, and the Heavenly Throne Room. Their presence serves to delineate these spaces as holy and set apart for divine purposes, reinforcing the sanctity of God's dwelling place among His people. In the biblical narrative, the cherubim act as sentinels, ensuring that only the worthy may enter into the presence of the Almighty. Exodus 25, 18-22, New American Standard Bible You shall make two cherubim of gold, make them of hammered work at the two ends of the atoning cover. Make one cherub at one end and one cherub at the other end. You shall make the cherubim of one piece with the atoning cover at its two ends. And the cherubim shall have their wings spread upward, 
covering the atoning cover with their wings and facing one another. The faces of the cherubim are to be turned towards the atoning cover. You shall put the atoning cover on top of the ark, and in the ark you shall put the testimony which I will give to you. There I will meet with you, and from above the atoning cover, from between the two cherubim which are upon the ark of the testimony, I will speak to you about every commandment that I will give you for the sons of Israel. The role of the cherubim as protectors and guardians is a prominent theme in biblical theology, as these celestial beings are often depicted as guardians of sacred spaces and symbols of God's presence. Throughout the Bible, cherubim serve as custodians of God's holiness and agents of His divine will, ensuring the sanctity and integrity of His dwelling place. Here are some key aspects of their role as protectors and guardians. And within it were figures resembling four living beings, and this was their appearance. They had human form. Each of them had four faces and four wings. Their legs were straight, and their feet were like a calf's hoof, and they sparkled like polished bronze. Under their wings on the four sides were human hands, and for the faces and wings of the four of them, their wings touched one another. Their faces did not turn when they moved, each went straight forward. As for the form of their faces, each had a human face, all four had the face of a lion on the right and the face of a bull on the left, and all four had the face of an eagle. Such were their faces. Their wings were spread out above. Each had two touching another being and two covering their bodies, and each went straight forward. Wherever the spirit was about to go, they would go, without turning as they went. In the midst of the living beings, there was something that looked like burning coals of fire, like torches moving among the living beings. The fire was bright and lightning was flashing from the fire, and the living beings ran back and forth like bolts of lightning. Ezekiel 1, 5-14, New American Standard Bible. Ezekiel 10, 1-22 The vision begins with Ezekiel seeing the likeness of a throne above the expanse that appeared like sapphire. Seated on the throne is the figure of God, whose appearance is like that of a man. He commands a man clothed in linen to go between the whirling wheels beneath the cherubim and take coals of fire from among them. The man does as instructed, taking the fire and scattering it over the city as a sign of judgment. Meanwhile, the cherubim are described as having the appearance of a human form with four faces and four wings. Each cherub has the face of a man, a lion, an ox, and an eagle. Their wings are spread out and they have human hands under their wings. The cherubim move with the wheels beside them, and the sound of their wings is compared to the voice of the Almighty. As Ezekiel continues to watch, the glory of the Lord departs from the temple, moving to the threshold of the temple. The cherubim lift their wings and rise from the earth with the wheels beside them. The glory of the Lord then departs from the city of Jerusalem, settling on the mountain to the east of the city. This passage underscores the holiness of God and His righteous judgment upon Jerusalem. The cherubim, as heavenly beings, serve as agents of God's divine will, executing His commands with awe-inspiring power and precision. The vision also highlights the departure of God's presence from His people due to their unfailingness and disobedience. Overall, Ezekiel 10 portrays the solemn reality of God's judgment and the consequences of sin, while also pointing to the hope of restoration and renewal in the future. These examples of cherubim encounters in Scripture highlight their roles as guardians of sacred spaces and symbols of God's presence. Whether stationed at the entrance to the Garden of Eden or overshadowing the mercy seat in the tabernacle, cherubim serve as reminders of the holiness and transcendence of God. Number 4. Seraphim Seraphim are celestial beings described in the Bible as attending the divine throne of God. The word seraphim comes from the Hebrew word seraph, which means burning or fiery. These angelic beings are mentioned specifically in Isaiah 6, 1-3. I saw the Lord, high and exalted, sitting on a throne in the year of King Uzziah's death. The temple was filled with the train of his robe. Seraphim perched above him, each with six wings, two for covering their faces, two for covering their feet, and two for flight. Holy, holy, holy is the Lord Almighty. The whole earth is full of His glory. The passage depicts the prophet Isaiah's vision of God's throne in the heavenly temple with seraphim surrounding Him. 
They are described as having six wings, two wings to cover their faces, two wings to cover their feet, and two wings for flying. The seraphim declare the holiness of God, repeating the phrase, Holy, holy, holy is the Lord Almighty, emphasizing the divine perfection and glory of God. Seraphim are often associated with themes of purity, reverence, and worship. Their presence near the divine throne symbolizes their role as ministers of God's holiness and agents of His divine will. They serve as intermediaries between God and humanity, conveying messages, offering praise, and carrying out His commands. Seraphim are regarded as one of the highest orders of angels, reflecting their proximity to the divine presence. They exemplify the awe-inspiring majesty and splendor of God's heavenly court, inspiring believers to offer reverence and adoration to the Almighty. As attendants of the divine throne, seraphim remind believers of the holiness and transcendence of God, inviting them into deeper communion with the Creator of the universe. Multi-winged creatures, seraphim are depicted as having six wings in Isaiah's vision, Isaiah 6.2. These wings are used for covering their faces and feet in reverence before God, as well as for flying. The multiple wings symbolizes their majestic and awe-inspiring appearance. Biblical accounts featuring seraphim are primarily found in the book of Isaiah. The prophet Isaiah provides a vivid description of seraphim in his vision of the divine throne. Additionally, while not explicitly identified as seraphim, there are other biblical passages that describe angelic beings engaging in worship and adoration of God. Revelation 4.8 And the four living creatures, each of them having six wings, are full of eyes around and within, and day and night they do not cease to say, Holy, holy, holy is the Lord God, the Almighty, who was and who is and who is to come. Although these beings are referred to as living creatures in the book of Revelation, their role and function bear similarities to the seraphim described by Isaiah. They are also engaged in perpetual worship, declaring the holiness of God day and night. These biblical accounts featuring seraphim emphasize their role as heavenly beings devoted to worshiping God and proclaiming His holiness. Their presence near the divine throne serves as a reminder of the transcendent majesty of God and His worthiness of ceaseless adoration and praise. Ephilim. Genesis 6, 1-4 Now it came about, when mankind began to multiply on the face of the land, and daughters were born to them, that the sons of God saw that the daughters of mankind were beautiful, and they took wives for themselves, whomever they chose. Then the Lord said, My spirit will not remain with man forever, because he is also flesh. Nevertheless, his days shall be one hundred twenty years. The Nephilim were on the earth in those days, and also afterward. When the sons of God came in to the daughters of mankind, and they bore children to them, those were the mighty men who were of old, men of renown. The Nephilim are figures mentioned in the Bible, particularly in the book of Genesis, who have captured the imagination of many for centuries. Despite their brief mention, the Nephilim have sparked numerous theories and interpretations regarding their identity, origins, and significance in ancient history and biblical theology. One interpretation of the Nephilim posits them as literal giants, being of immense stature and strength. God did not intend for the human race to remain in this rebellious state indefinitely. This means that our rejection of God has reached a point of no return. God will not woo us indefinitely. There will come a time when He says, no more. The Bible gives us hints at a world that has deviated far from what God intended. So, as Noah builds his ark, a massive vessel about 450 feet long, 75 feet wide, and 45 feet high, you can feel that something really bad is about to happen. Let us put Noah's ark size into perspective with things we're familiar with today. Noah gathers his family and pairs all living creatures as instructed by God. The ark turns into a sign of safety and hope during the flood. Then the rains come. It's not just a heavy downpour, it's like the heavens themselves have opened up. Water covers the earth higher than the mountains. Every living thing that moved on the earth perished. Only Noah was left and those with him in the ark. Genesis 7, 21-23 After 40 days and 40 nights, the rain stops. The waters eventually subside and the ark rested on the mountains of Ararat. 
Now, think of this like parking your car on a big, tall hill after a massive storm. But instead of a car, it's a massive boat, and instead of a hill, it's a whole group of big mountains. Noah and his family step out into a new world. God makes a covenant with Noah, promising never to destroy the earth with a flood again, marked by the rainbow in the sky. You would think this would be the last time we read about the Nephilim or giants, but after this, we see various instances. The Exploration of Canaan It appears that the fallen angels commit their sin again after the flood. However, it is likely that it occurred to a much lesser extent than before the flood. We go to Numbers 13.33. Here we meet a new set of characters, Moses, the Israelite spies, and the inhabitants of Canaan, including the descendants of Anak, who are linked to the Nephilim. Who exactly were these descendants of Anak? The Bible introduces them during the story of Moses sending 12 spies to explore the land of Canaan. The spies come back with a startling report. We saw the Nephilim there. The descendants of Anak come from the Nephilim. We seemed like grasshoppers in our own eyes, and we look the same to them. This verse suggests that the descendants of Anak were related to the Nephilim, known for their great size and strength. Moses, leading the Israelites out of Egypt, sends spies to scout the Promised Land. Hold on, didn't we just say the Nephilim were wiped out in the flood? In the Old Testament, giant is most commonly referred to by the word Rephaim. Throughout the entirety of the Old Testament narrative, the Rephaim serve as a fascinating and significant recurring motif. Where does the Bible mention Rephaim? The Rephaim are first mentioned in Genesis 14. The Rephaim, along with other large people, are also mentioned in Deuteronomy 2, 20-21. Deuteronomy 2, 20-21 It is also regarded as the land of the Rephaim, because the Rephaim previously lived in it, but the Ammonites called them Zamzumin, a people as great, numerous, and tall as the Anakim. But the Lord destroyed them before them, and they dispossessed them and settled in their place. The name Rephaim, which literally means terrible ones, gives us an indication of the intimidating and fearsome nature of these individuals. This is not the only time we see these giants after the flood. In Deuteronomy 3, there's an interesting story about King Og of Bashan, a giant man. Og is referred to as the last of the Rephaim in Deuteronomy 3.11 and later in the book of Numbers in Joshua. Rephaim is a Hebrew word for giants. The king Israel had to deal with was King Og of Bashan, who sent his entire army against Israel. The Israelites then marched towards Bashan where King Og confronted them at Edre. Because of Og's reputation, the Israelites were terrified. Do not be afraid of him, for I have delivered him into your hands along with his entire army and his land, God assured Moses. The book of Deuteronomy includes a narrative of a conflict that occurred between forces led by Moses and those led by Og. According to the biblical account, Og was the ruler of 60 different walled cities, all of which were taken by the Israelites. Israel slayed the entire forces and conquered all 60 cities in the kingdom of Og, which had the same tall walls as Sihon's. When God chose to hand over an enemy to his people, even strong fortified cities were no match for the enemy. In addition to this, he was a very large man and slept in a bed made of iron that was 9 cubits long and 4 cubits wide, 13.5 feet long and 6 feet wide. The inclusion of this detail draws attention to Og's massive stature. A man in need of this size bed was most likely tall. Israel destroyed the entire population and took control of all 60 cities in Og's kingdom, which had the same high walls as Sihon's. When God decided to hand over an enemy to his people, high-walled cities were no match. Later, at the city of Jericho, the most spectacular demonstration of that truth would occur. According to Deuteronomy 3.11, Og was a descendant of the Raphaites, indicating a man of great stature or giant. His colossal bed had become famous and, no doubt, had been saved as a memento. Joshua 12.4, New American Standard Bible And the territory of Og, king of Bashan, one of the remnant of the Rephaim, who lived at Asheroth at Edre. After this, we then see another giant. 
The most well-known giant in history is Goliath from the Bible. He was a champion from the Philistine camp who fought as an armored charioteer. He was dressed in what we'd call a mail coat. The Philistines warmed up by donning a large canvas-like undergarment with overlapping bronze ringlets. From shoulder to knee, this coat of mail shielded the wearer from the enemy's weapons. Body armor of this size and type weighed 5,000 shekels of bronze, which equates to between 175 and 200 pounds in modern terms. The armor only included the coat of mail. Goliath, on the other hand, wore a bronze helmet, bronze leggings, greaves to protect his shins, and carried a bronze javelin or spear slung between his shoulders. Was Goliath a Nephilim? Some scholars believe that Goliath the Gittite, a Gath resident, belonged to a race known as the Nephilim. Other experts argue that Goliath was a Rephaite because the Nephilim were destroyed in the Great Flood during Noah's time, only Noah's family survived. Some scholars believe the Philistines descended from the Anakim. Goliath's champion status is enhanced by the fact that Gath was an ancient Anakim stronghold. Some scientists believe Goliath has an identifiable family tree, implying autosmal dominant inheritance, which causes familial acromegaly or gigantism. The Relations of Goliath There are also other giants mentioned in 2 Samuel 21, 15 through 22, and 1 Chronicles 20, 4 through 8, who were related to Goliath in the Bible. This event occurred when David was old. 2 Samuel 21 there was a war at Gath again, where there was a man of great stature who had six fingers on each hand and six toes on each foot, twenty-four in number. He also was a descendant of the giants. And when he taunted and defied Israel, Jonathan, the son of Shimei, David's brother, killed him. These four warriors were descended from the giant in Gath, and they fell by the hands of David and his servants. Since Goliath was from Gath, these were Goliath's sons or brothers. How did they survive the flood? But here's the big question. If the Nephilim were around before the great flood, and the flood wiped out all but Noah and his family, how could the descendants of Anak, which are linked to the Nephilim, be around after the flood? When we consider the flood, we read, He blotted out every living thing that was upon the face of the ground. Genesis 7.23 this verse makes it clear that the flood was incredibly comprehensive in its destruction. So, how could the Nephilim have survived such an event? There are different opinions to this. Some suggest that the Nephilim mentioned afterwards in Genesis were a new group, unrelated to those before the flood. Others propose that the term Nephilim might not refer to a specific lineage, but rather a title or description given to giants or mighty warriors across different eras. It is also possible that after the flood, the demons mated with human females again, resulting in more Nephilim. It's even possible that some Nephilim characteristics were passed down through the lineage of one of Noah's daughters-in-law. Another perspective comes from the book of Numbers 13.33, where the Nephilim are mentioned again long after the flood. So, did the Nephilim survive the flood? Or were the post-flood giants a different group altogether? As we think about this mystery, it reminds us of the many interesting stories and people in the Bible. It makes us want to learn more, ask questions, and be curious. Based on a few theories that Bible scholars and enthusiasts consider, some suggest that Nephilim might not have referred to a specific group of people, but rather was a term used to describe any large and mighty warriors. So, how do these pieces fit together? On one hand, we have Noah and his family, the sole human survivors of the Flood. On the other, centuries later, there's a mention of the Nephilim or their descendants in Canaan. Flood but continuous sin So why did God send the Flood if he knew sin would still be around after it? Let's dig into this using Genesis 6, 1-7 as our guide. The Nephilim and the Great Flood are more than just ancient stories. They offer valuable lessons in spiritual warfare that are relevant to us today. Just like the Nephilim were part of the physical and spiritual problems of that time, we too face challenges that aren't just physical but spiritual. The union of the sons of God and the daughters of human resulted in chaos, showing how stepping away from God's path can lead to serious consequences. 
In the same light, when we go against God's will for our lives, it can result in a significant impact on our spiritual lives by relying on God's power. So when we read about the descendants of Anak being linked to the Nephilim, it opens up a whole world of questions and interpretations. It's like piecing together a puzzle with some pieces missing. In other words, the Bible invites us to explore, to wonder, and to seek deeper understanding. The flood story, which talks about the mysterious Nephilim, fallen angels, and how evil had engulfed the earth, is a really powerful story about how people are judged, how they can be saved, and how good people stay strong. It makes us ponder, how do we remain faithful in a world that often seems to be drifting away from moral and spiritual anchors? Numbers Behemoth, the mighty beast of the earth. Look at Behemoth, which I made along with you, and which feeds on grass like an ox. What strength it has in its loins, what power in the muscles of its belly. Its tail sways like a cedar. The sinews of its thighs are close-knit. Its bones are tubes of bronze, its limbs like rods of iron. It ranks first among the works of God, yet its maker can approach it with his sword. The hills bring their produce, and all the wild animals play nearby. Under the lotus plants it lies, hidden among the reeds in the marsh. The lotuses conceal it in their shadow. The poplars by the stream surround it. A raging river does not alarm it. It is secure, though the Jordan should surge against its mouth. Can anyone capture it by the eyes or trap it and pierce its nose? Behemoth is a mysterious and formidable creature mentioned in the Bible, particularly in the book of Job, where it is described as a mighty beast of the earth. The description of Behemoth in Job 40, 15-24 paints a vivid picture of a powerful and untamable creature whose strength and stature inspire awe and wonder. While the identity of Behemoth remains a subject of debate and speculation, its portrayal in the biblical narrative serves as a symbol of God's sovereignty over creation and the awe-inspiring complexity of the natural world. The passage in Job begins with God challenging Job to consider the greatness and majesty of Behemoth, saying, Look at Behemoth, which I made along with you, and which feeds on grass like an ox. Job 40.15 NIV This introductory statement emphasizes Behemoth's creation by God and its role as a creature of the earth, similar to domesticated livestock such as oxen. The description of Behemoth continues with details of its physical attributes and behavior. Its tail sways like a cedar. The sinews of its thighs are close-knit. Its limbs like iron rods and its bones are bronze tubes, Job 40, 17-18 in IV. These vivid imagery highlights Behemoth's immense size, strength, and durability, comparing its tail to the mighty cedar tree and its bones and limbs to metal. Furthermore, Behemoth's diet and habit are described. It ranks first among the works of God, yet its maker can approach it with its sword. All the wild animals play close by, and the hills send it their produce. Job 40, 19-20 NIV This passage suggests that Behemoth is the pinnacle of God's creation, surpassing all other creatures in strength and significance. Despite its power, Behemoth remains subject to God's authority, as evidenced by the mention of God approaching it with his sword. The passage concludes with a reflection on Behemoth's unassailable nature and the impossibility of capturing or subduing it. Can anyone capture it by the eyes or trap it and pierce its nose? Job 40, 24 in IV. This rhetorical question emphasizes Behemoth's untamable and uncontrollable nature, highlighting its status as a creature beyond human comprehension and dominion. Physical Attributes the description of Behemoth in Job 40 emphasizes its physical attributes, including its immense size, strength, and durability. Behemoth's tail is likened to a cedar tree, its bones to tubes of bronze, and its limbs to rods of iron, Job 40, 17-18. These descriptions evoke a sense of grandeur and power, suggesting that Behemoth is a creature of unparalleled strength and stature. Herbivorous Diet Behemoth is described as feeding on grass like an ox, Job 40.15, indicating that it's an herbivorous creature. This detail contrasts with other creatures mentioned in the book of Job, such as the Leviathan, which is described as a carnivorous sea monster. 
Behemoth's herbivorous diet suggests a gentler and more peaceful nature in contrast to the ferocity and aggression associated with carnivorous predators. Significance and Symbolism Attached to Behemoth The story of Behemoth in the Bible shows us how powerful and amazing God is. It reminds us of how God created everything with great variety and beauty. When we think about Behemoth, we should be amazed and give praise to God because it represents His strength, His ability to create wonderful things, and how far beyond our understanding He is. It's a call for all Christians to look at God's creation and respond with wonder and love, recognizing His mighty power and the greatness of what He has made. Biblical References to Behemoth In the Bible, the term behemoth appears only in the book of Job, specifically in Job 40, 15-24. This passage provides the most detailed description of behemoth and is the primary biblical reference to this enigmatic creature. Here is the relevant passage. Job 40, 15-24, Amplified Bible Behold now, behemoth, which I created as well as you, he eats grass like an ox. See now, his strength is in his loins, and his power is in the muscles and sinews of his belly. He sways his tail like a cedar. The tendons of his thighs are twisted and knit together like a rope. His bones are tubes of bronze, his limbs are like bars of iron. He is the first in magnitude and power of the works of God. Only he who made him can bring near his sword to master him. Surely the mountains bring him food, and all the wild animals play there. He lies down under the lotus plants in the hidden shelter of the reeds in the marsh. The lotus plants cover him with their shade, the willows of the brook surround him. If a river rages and overflows, he does not tremble. He is confident, though the Jordan River swells and rushes against his mouth. Can anyone capture him when he is on watch, or pierce his nose with barbs to trap him? Numbers Angel of the Lord Who is this angel? There are numerous accounts of angels briefly manifesting themselves in the physical realm and making face-to-face -face appearances with people who God was actively working with at the time. These accounts can be found all throughout the Bible. When looking at the scriptures in the Old Testament that describe human interaction with angels, there is one being that stands out above all the others for several different reasons. We first meet this angel in the Hagar story. Sarah, the wife of Abram, Abraham, had an Egyptian girl named Hagar who worked for her as a slave. The book of Genesis chapter 16 is where the majority of Hagar's information can be found. After God had made his presence known to Abram and given him the promise of a land of his own and an inheritance, ten years passed and the couple still did not have a child. Because Sarah could not wait any longer, she decided to take matters into her own hands and gave her maid to her husband. Abram obeyed her instructions and as a result, Hagar became pregnant. Sarah became envious of the younger girl when she started flaunting her expanding waistline. This was despite the fact that Sarah was the one who got them into this adulterous situation in the first place. In anger, Sarah started treating Hagar harshly. Genesis 16, 7-14, Amplified Bible But the angel of the Lord found her by a spring of water in the wilderness, on the road to Egypt by the way of Shur. And he said, Hagar, Sarai's maid, where did you come from and where are you going? And she said, I am running away from my mistress Sarai. The angel of the Lord said to her, Go back to your mistress and submit humbly to her authority. Then the angel of the Lord said to her, I will greatly multiply your descendants so that they will be too many to count. The angel of the Lord continued, Behold, you are with child and you will bear a son, and you shall name him Ishmael, God hears, because the Lord has heard and paid attention to your persecution suffering. He, Ishmael, will be a wild donkey of a man, his hand will be against every man, continually fighting, and every man's hand against him, and he will dwell in defiance of all his brothers. Then she called the name of the Lord who spoke to her, You are God who sees, for she said, Have I not even here in the wilderness remained alive after seeing him who sees me with understanding and compassion? Therefore the well was called Bir Lahai Roy, well of the living one who sees me. It is between Kadesh and Bered. 
The angel of the Lord had a physical presence and communicated with Hagar in the same way that two people would communicate with one another. There is no indication that this was merely a spiritual impression or a voice carried on the breeze in our opinion. The angel of the Lord was physically present with Hagar and that person was present with them both at the same time. This is the very first time that the angel of the Lord is mentioned in the Holy Scriptures. It was not Noah, Enoch, or Abram who saw him for the first time. The first person that the angel of the Lord appeared to was Hagar. The angel of the Lord told her to repent. If she changed her direction, there was an inherent promise, Obey me, and I will protect you. Jesus didn't exactly tell Hagar to go back to an abusive household. He made an implied promise of protection. The angel of the Lord found her there and comforted her, telling her to return to her mistress and giving her a prophecy concerning her son. The angel of the Lord also appeared to Abraham in order to save Isaac. Genesis 22, 10-18 And Abraham reached out with his hand and took his knife to slaughter his son. But the angel of the Lord called to him from heaven and said, Abraham, Abraham, and he said, Here I am. He said, Do not reach out your hand against the boy, and do not do anything to him. For now I know that you fear God, since you have not withheld your son, your only son, from me. Then Abraham raised his eyes and looked, and behold, behind him was a ram caught in the thicket by its horns. And Abraham went and took the ram and offered it up as a burnt offering in the place of his son. And Abraham named that place, The Lord Will Provide, as it is said to this day, On the mountain of the Lord it will be provided. Then the angel of the Lord called to Abraham a second time from heaven and said, By myself I have sworn, declares the Lord, because you have done this thing, and have not withheld your son, your only son. Indeed, I will greatly bless you, and I will greatly multiply your seed as the stars of the heavens, and as the sand which is on the seashore. And your seed shall possess the gate of their enemies. And in your seed all the nations of the earth shall be blessed, because you have obeyed my voice. After this, Abraham acknowledged that God had provided for the keeping of his word and he named the location Jehovah-Jireh, which means the Lord will provide. While Abraham's weakness of faith is chronicled in Genesis 18-22, God did not reject him or punish him for that immaturity. However, God did give him opportunities for growth and then put him through tests so that he could demonstrate the growth that he had experienced. Abraham discovered that God is faithful, and even if we do not know how God is going to keep his word, we can be certain that he is faithful and that he will keep his word. Number 8. The Ophanim The Strangest Angel in the Bible What are the Ophanim? Ophanim is the ancient Hebrew word for wheels. The singular is Ophan. Of course, wheels are cited several times in the Old Testament, and Ophanim can refer to normal wheels on a cart or chariot, but of particular interest are the wheels on the throne of God mentioned in Ezekiel's vision. Ophanim are mentioned in Ezekiel 1, 15-21. The Ophanim reveal our God as king and affirm the sovereignty of his reign. What does the Bible say about the Ophanim? In the year 597 BC, the Babylonians who were invading Judah took Jehoiakim, king of Judah, along with a priest named Ezekiel and 10,000 other Jews and carried them to a hamlet called Tel Abib. Ezekiel had been in exile for five years when God appeared to him by a river in Chabar, which is now in Middle East. God used this encounter to start Ezekiel's ministry as a prophet by showing him an astounding vision. It is hard to provide a definition for the Ophanim depicted in Ezekiel's vision without taking into account the entirety of the revelation. God chooses to open the heavens in front of Ezekiel's temporal eyes. Ezekiel witnessed a foreboding cloud of lightning and flame coming from the direction of the north. Within the cloud, there are four lighted beings that shone brightly. Despite the fact that the beings have the appearance of humans, they are not human in any way. Each of them possesses four different faces, one human face, one lion face, one ox face, and one eagle face. The prophet doesn't record these creatures by name in Ezekiel 1, where the recounting of his vision begins. 
but by chapter 10, they're identified as cherubim. What Ezekiel saw or described in this passage is difficult to visualize in its entirety. It is presumably an image of a magnificent chariot with four wheels that is bringing the throne of God. The scene gives the impression of continuous motion and activity not only on the part of the living beings themselves, but also on the part of the throne that God sits on. Ezekiel 1.26, Amplified Bible Now above the expanse that was over their heads, there was something resembling a throne. It appeared like it was made of sapphire or lapis lazuli, and seated on that which looked like a throne, high up was a figure with the appearance of a man. We read, when they moved, they went towards any one of four directions, they did not turn aside when they went. The sense seems to be that the wheels and their workings could move in any direction, but there was no sense of chaos or disorder to their movements. A popular Bible commentator stated about this, like a ball bearing, they could move in any direction without any steering mechanism. As for their rims, they were so high they were awesome, and their rims were full of eyes. Again, it is difficult to imagine in one's mind exactly what Ezekiel saw or stated in this passage. The description of full of eyes was how John described the cherubim themselves. Revelation 4.6 And before the throne there was something like a sea of glass, like crystal, and in the center and around the throne four living creatures full of eyes in front and behind. The sense is of excellent knowledge and intelligence. They are not dead metal. Their livingness is shown by their eyes with which they can see the way and by their lifelink with the living creatures above them. The four wheels and their workings move in step with the four cherubim as they rotated. They were linked together in such a way that Ezekiel was able to write, the spirit of the living creatures was in the wheels. Ophanim are also mentioned similarly in Ezekiel 10, 9-13. Ezekiel 10, 9-13 Then I looked, and behold, four wheels beside the cherubim, one wheel beside each cherub, and the appearance of the wheels was like the gleam of a Tarshish stone. And as for their appearance, all four of them had the same likeness, as if one wheel were within another wheel. When they moved, they went in any of their four directions without turning as they went, but they followed in the direction which they faced without turning as they went. And their whole body, their backs, their hands, their wings, and the wheels were covered with eyes all around the wheels belonging to all four of them. The wheels were called, as I heard, the whirling wheels. There were four wheels by the cherubim. Ezekiel 1, 15-21 described these wheels in some detail. The general impression is of constant activity, motion, and free movement with no chaos or disorder. They did not turn aside when they went, but followed in the direction the head was facing. If the wheels and the cherubim described God's chariot or chariot throne, then it is clear that Ezekiel was to understand that it was on the move. It was in Babylon, now it is in Jerusalem at the temple. Ezekiel 1.18 describes eyes in reference with the wheels. Here we learn that the cherubim themselves were full of eyes all around, and this fits the latter characterization of cherubim found in Revelation 4.6. The image seems bizarre to the modern reader, but one must remember that this is a visionary experience and surrealistic features may overwhelm realism. In the passages above, the throne of God is set on wheels, ophanim, and then pushed by four angels. There are wheels inside of wheels at cross angles with the effect that the throne can move in any direction without having to turn. The angels who are powering the throne also have four faces, one facing each direction, so they can likewise travel in any order without turning. The angels are identified as cherubim. Why do some refer to the Ophanim as angels? There is not a single mention of the Ophanim in the Bible being angelic creatures, but apocryphal Jewish writers branded them as a class of angel and list them in their hierarchy of angels along with the seraphim, and cherubim because of the Ophanim's unique lifelikeness, their supernatural power, and their close proximity to God's throne, not to mention the multitude of eyes. Whether or not the Ophanim are actually angelic beings, 
or merely a divinely powered mechanism of multidimensional transport doesn't matter. What does matter is the Ophanim's function in displaying God's glory to Ezekiel and every other believer who would one day read his account and gain a renewed vision of God's kingship. What do the Ophanim reveal about God? Both in appearance and operation, the Ophanim that appear in Ezekiel's vision demonstrate God's absolute dominion over the entire cosmos. The omnidirectional wheels themselves serve as a constant reminder to us that the God we serve is omnipresent, meaning that He is able to be in all places at all times. As the Spirit of God guides the cherubim, Ezekiel 1.12, that same Spirit indwells the Ophanim. When the creatures moved, they also moved. When the creatures stood still, they also stood still, and when the creatures rose from the ground, the wheels rose along with them, because the spirit of the living creatures was in the wheels. Ezekiel 1.20 This symbolic unity of submission displays God's supreme authority and right to rule and reign, His omnipotence. And the eyes that cover the wheels and the cherubim are symbolic of God's omniscience. He is all-seeing, all-knowing. Why is it important for Christians to know about the supernatural realm? Ephesians 6, 11-12 Put on the full armor of God, so that you will be able to stand firm against the schemes of the devil. For our struggle is not against flesh and blood, but against the rulers, against the powers, against the world forces of this darkness, against the spiritual forces of wickedness in the heavenly places. In Ephesians 6, 12, we're told that our struggle is not against flesh. God desires believers to be aware of the world beyond what our temporal eyes can see, so that we, in the Lord's mighty power, can be prepared to take on whatever scheme the enemy has in store. Extremism is prevalent in today's society. On one end of the scale, there are believers who downplay the supernatural parts of their faith and insist on maintaining a naturalistic worldview which is characterized by an exclusive reliance on the truths of doctrinal teachings for day-to-day -day living. Number 9. Lucifer How, why, and when did Lucifer fall from heaven? The description of Lucifer's fall from heaven are found symbolically in Isaiah 14, 12-14 and Ezekiel 28, 12-18. Although these passages are directly related to the king of Babylon and Tyre, Many believe they also allude to the spiritual force influencing these rulers, identified as Satan. While these scriptures provide insights into the reason behind Satan's downfall, they don't specify the timing of these events. However, Jesus, who exists beyond time, observed this fall and referenced it in Luke 10.18. I saw Satan fall like lightning from heaven. In Luke 10.18, Jesus says, I saw Satan fall like lightning from heaven. This statement was made in response to the return of the 70 or 72 disciples that Jesus had sent to evangelize and prepare his way to Jerusalem. Jesus had given these disciples specific instructions. Jesus witnesses this fall. This text affirms the idea that Jesus existed before his human birth and that he was present in the judgment of Satan. It also provides insight into how the devil was sentenced to live on earth, which sets the stage for the conflict between angels. The text in question affirms not only the pre-existence of Jesus. It also provides valuable insight into how the devil was sentenced to earth, which sets the stage for the angelic conflict that would later arise. In essence, this text sheds light on the interplay between the divine and the evil one and how it shapes the course of human history. The fall of Satan that Jesus saw happened after Lucifer's sin, before the temptation of Adam and Eve in the Garden of Eden. We know that the angels were created before the earth, Job 38, 4-7. Satan fell before he tempted Adam and Eve in the Garden. Satan's rebellion against God happened after the angels were created, but before he led Adam and Eve into temptation in the Garden of Eden. The Bible doesn't specify exactly when this event took place, whether it was hours, days, or even years before the temptation in Eden. We learn from the book of Job that during Job's era, Satan could still enter heaven and appear before God's throne. At that period, Satan was seemingly able to move freely between heaven and earth, directly communicating with God and explaining his actions. 
There's ongoing debate about whether this access has been revoked. Some argue that Satan's entry to heaven ceased with Christ's crucifixion. Others contend it will be cut off during the end-time celestial conflict described in Revelation 12, 7-12. This verse uses various titles for Satan, dragon, serpent, devil, Satan, and deceiver, portraying him as vicious, accusatory, adversarial, and deceitful. The term devil originates from the Greek word diabolos, which comes from the verb diabolo, meaning to defame or to slander. In Christianity, the devil is believed to be the master accuser of the brethren and is often associated with evil and temptation. Satan was expelled from heaven due to his immense pride. He harbored a desire to be like God instead of serving him. This ambition is highlighted throughout the numerous I will declarations found in Isaiah 14, 12 through 15. Furthermore, Ezekiel 28, 12 through 15 portrays Satan as an extraordinarily attractive angel emphasizing the splendor that may have contributed to his pride and subsequent fall. Satan was probably the most exalted of all angels, holding the title of the anointed cherub and considered the most splendid among God's creations. However, he wasn't satisfied with his role. His ambition drove him to aspire to God's position, aiming to usurp God's authority and dominate the universe himself. This craving to be God is precisely what Satan used to entice Adam and Eve in the Garden of Eden. Satan was expelled from heaven due to his sinful actions. God removed him because heaven is not a place for someone as evil as Satan. He fell from heaven because God actively cast him out. Isaiah 14, 15, Ezekiel 28, 16 through 17. Satan's removal from heaven was a consequence of his transgressions. God's holy and perfect nature cannot coexist with sin, which is why Satan could no longer remain in such a pure place. His expulsion underscores the serious consequences of rebelling against God. Lucifer became prideful and lifted himself above God. As a result, God cast him down from his original place in heaven, along with other angels who had followed him in rebellion. This event is often referred to as the war in heaven, and is believed to have resulted in Satan becoming the ruler of the fallen angels. Jesus spoke of Satan's fall from glorified to profane. Falling like lightning from heaven was as dramatic and sudden as a bolt of lightning from heaven. Did you know that every time the kingdom of Jesus is presented in truth and power, it is like another judgment upon Satan and all who share his rebellious spirit? Where the gospel is preached with divine power, Satan comes down from his throne in human hearts and human minds as rapidly as the lightning flash falls from heaven. And when we see his kingdom shaken, then, like Jesus, we rejoice in spirit. It's amazing to think that the preaching of the gospel can have such a powerful impact on the spiritual realm. In remembering the fall of Satan, Jesus also warned them against pride. You see, if even someone as powerful and privileged as Satan could fall from grace, then surely anyone could. It's a reminder that in any important endeavor, we must be careful not to get too caught up. As the saying goes, pride comes before the fall. Number 10. Who was Melchizedek? Melchizedek was an enigmatic figure who appeared briefly on the stage of human history, then disappeared. Despite being one of the least mentioned and most mysterious individuals in the Old Testament, Melchizedek, the king priest of Salem, is foundational for understanding key concepts in the Bible. The question is, who exactly is this mysterious figure? What does this dynastic order tell us about Christ's role as king and priest? In Hebrew, this name means king of righteousness or my king is righteous. The first mention of this name can be dated about two millennia before Christ, the second around one millennia before Jesus was born, and the third in the second half of the first century after the birth of Jesus. The king of Sodom greeted Abraham upon his return from battle. He refused to take anything from the king when he offered him goods. Abram refused any part of the loot because he would not allow anyone say they made him rich. He determined that God alone should be credited for all of his success and wealth. However, from Melchizedek, Abraham received bread and wine and a blessing from God Most High, creator of heaven and earth. Genesis 14, 18-22 
and Melchizedek, the king of Salem, brought out bread and wine. Now he was a priest of God Most High, and he blessed him and said, Blessed be Abram of God Most High, possessor of heaven and earth, and blessed be God Most High, who has handed over your enemies to you. And he gave him a tenth of everything. Then the king of Sodom said to Abraham, Give the people to me and take the possessions for yourself. But Abram said to the king of Sodom, I have sworn to the Lord God Most High, possessor of heaven and earth. This man was king of Salem, as we see in Psalm 76 2, where we read, His tabernacle is in Salem, Jerusalem. His dwelling place is in Zion. We have no clue of where Melchizedek arrived from, how he came to be in Canaan, how he came to be a worshiper and priest of the true God, and how Abram came to know about him. The only thing we know is that he was there. Melchizedek was both a king and a priest, which made him unique. Historically, combining religious authority with civic authority has often been dangerous. God forbade the kings of Israel to be priests and the priests to be kings. David writing about Melchizedek David composed a psalm about a millennium after Abraham describing his Lord as both king and priest. In the first verse of this psalm, the Lord invited David's Lord to sit at his right hand in royal splendor. Psalm 110.4 The Lord has sworn and will not change his mind. You are a priest forever, according to the order of Melchizedek. We read, You are a priest forever, according to the order of Melchizedek. He vowed that the Messiah had an eternal priesthood, and that it was after the pattern, order of Melchizedek. Melchizedek wasn't just an everyday worshiper of the true God. He held a respected position as the priest of the Most High God, a title that highlights his significance. The grandeur of God elevated the prestige of Melchizedek's priesthood, making him a noteworthy figure in history. There is no mention of any father or mother of Melchizedek, and he appears without any genealogy. We read, You are a priest forever according to the order of Melchizedek. 